Good evening, welcome to Blues Talking. Another Tuesday at Henry Blues House. Um, we are honoured as well. Wait a service. No, thank you. Yes, Karen. Please uh, welcome Debbie Jones of Tipitina. Now, although Debbie and I have known each other for a while, she had a pretty long career before I even encountered her. In fact, can I just remind you how we met? Go you on, were playing Jim. with your trio, with yeah. strange instrumentation, you, piano and drums, yeah. at a little pub on the corner of Gas Street. That's right. And after the set, I wandered up and sat by you. Scruffy Duffy's. That's it. And I said, <laughs> strange lineup. And you said, what's it got to do with you? <laughs> <laughs> and I have been one of the white men ever since. Take a joke. Where were you brought up? I was brought up in a place called Charnet Richard in Lancashire, um, close to Leyland actually. Uh, my dad was a Leylander. My mum was from the west of Ireland, a little tiny village in the west of Ireland called Kilkelly. Um, and, but basically that's where I was brought up in Charnet Richard. Um, yeah, basically. Uh, so when did you first encounter music of any sort? Of any sort, okay. So I was, I was lucky really because my dad was... Um, massively into music. I would describe him as a busker, really. He was very passionate about music. He wasn't a professional or anything, but he played in bands as a young man. Um, but he wasn't a pro, but he always, we always had the guitar out there. He's like, let's get the guitar out. So it's like a sing song. It was like sing songs in the house. That, all, that was just my life. And I thought that was kind of normal. So I would be hearing things like Ray Charles, not knowing it was Ray Charles. My dad was singing, I can't stop loving you, or all those like classic Ray Charles country sort of stuff um, and then my mum couldn't sing a note absolutely but she knew every single Irish song um, <laughs> so she was always teaching me uh, Irish Irish songs and I was never quite sure of the melody but my dad would always say no no that's that's, not. that's the lyric but that's not the melody so yeah so that's kind of where um, that's why I kind of love you know the, in, in a lot of country music you hear the the um, the expression of the of the ballads and stuff. I think it's, there's a lot of that, of that in Irish folk stuff, really. The folk ballads, I guess. But then my dad was really into Ray Charles and Elvis, of course. Um, um, yeah, and just Jerry Lee, Jerry Lee Lewis. He was a big fan of Jerry Lee. So really, you never stood a chance. I know. <laughs> I guess not really. So we, you obviously first what you did first was to sing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. When did you start to play? Did you play guitar? Well, um, my uh, so I played guitar, guitar actually, just as a, like my dad really, a bit like a busker, playing a few chords and strumming along, probably for the age of six, five, six, just teaching me a few little chords and little things like that, just playing uh, on top of Old Smokey, uh, you know, things like that, just easy little little melodies. Um, and then there was a local a local little uh, club <coughs> in a place called Exton. And my dad, my dad used to like a pint, you know, and we'd go in on a Sunday afternoon and uh, there'd always be some music, some crack going, we'd call it the crack, you know, like in Ireland. And uh, we'd, there'd always be singing and dancing and we'd say, Debbie, get up and give us a song. So that was probably age of five, I was up singing on the stage, you know, doing that and never thinking, just thinking it was kind of normal to do that and not really getting it until I was much older, but other kids didn't really do that kind of thing, I guess. Of my age, anyway. That explains your um, total lack of fear about performance. And we, we've talked about music a lot together over, over the years, which we've been knowing each other, and she approaches everything without fear. So try anything, which is great. I mean, it's, it's I'll try great. things, but there's, there's, I, would, I would say I, I do suffer so, from fear. So who did you, well, you hide it well. <laughs> so who did you, who did you know you were listening to first? Who, did you, who, did, who got you earlier on? Um, Ray Charles. Hmm. And then when I was a bit older, probably about 10 or 11, was when the Blues Brothers came out, the film ah. around that time. And I, it was on the TV and I remember seeing Aretha and, and just being absolutely blown away. Just, I'd never heard anything like that in my life. You know, um, although I'd heard Ray Charles, but I'd heard my dad do it. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 or people like that, you know, the soul singers and the blues singers, um, and I suppose gospel really. And then her, hearing her do that, and then also hearing, you know, there's a there's a bit in, in the film 
where there's a, there's a gospel moment in it. Yeah, you're true. Oh, yeah, and I just loved it. I thought, oh, that is amazing. I didn't realise um, what it was, but I just loved it. Absolutely. I love the energy, the energy of it, you know. So. so how did your parents explain away the, the bad language in the blues brothers film? I didn't know I'd watched it. I didn't know I'd watched it. Yeah. So we've talked a bit about this. You, you do lean towards country a lot, don't you? I mean, in your personal taste. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I love Bonnie Ray. I mean, although she's a blues player, but she's also very got that country sort of country blues, really, isn't she? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do. It's it's the, it's the melodies and the the lyrics and the. the from the heart, aren't they? And I, I, I'd like to think that that's where I sing from. You know. Well, I do, I do. I, I hope it comes across that way. It, it, it does indeed. But can we miss something else? Gospel. Yeah. Okay. When so, I first got to know you, yeah. um, I was very impressed about your gospel background. Did you record your I mean, email well, album? Well, there was um, the, the, the gospel choir that I was in at the time was recorded, yeah on the, the best gospel album in the world ever. Which is a pretty modest claim. <laughs> um, and the yeah, amazing, amazing choir from Preston, uh, run by the, a wonderfully, oh, just a wonderful man called Tyndale Thomas, who's one of them people that when you, you know, you meet people in your life, and he was one of those very influential, incredible singer, great songwriter, <laughs> and, and just sort of very, um, Scott got me involved in the choir very quickly, and not just that choir, but doing other things, other bits, and, and gave me the confidence to sing with with some really incredible gospel singers. You know, like there's been moments where I've sung with people, I'm just like, oh, this is just singing with like the best, in my opinion, the two of the best singers I've ever heard, and saints out there singing some harmonies and singing along. I love harmonies as well. That's another thing. It's um, I'm, I'm sure that they feel the same about you. I, I know you can't actually answer that much no. <laughs> for bits, but um, when we could sing first sang Bowie, you quickly got fans from everywhere, didn't you? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we we absolutely love coming to Birmingham. It's our favourite place, really. Um, we've had so so such lovely response from people. Everybody's so friendly, so warm, and we just love coming here. Uh, how many years have we been doing jazz festival now? Since, since, since 2006. Since 2006. Wow, getting old. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. <laughs> but it's been it's been such a pleasure, and um, thanks to Jim for you know for having a bit of vision. Let's continue on it. Yeah. Which is uh, one of your huge loves. Why did you first just? I'm sure I know the answer to this. How did you first discover the music? Okay, so I was, um, again, as a child, I was really into Elvis, you know. Uh, my dad sort of introduced me to all that stuff. And uh, I remember the first time hearing Lord and the Lord on the on the piano. I love that. I had piano lessons as well back at the age of 10. And um, I just loved it. And I was trying to work it out, you know, what's he doing? It was I was having classical piano lessons at the time. And my teacher was very like formal and he said, what's he doing? You know, and um, not realising it was actually a Lloyd Price song from New Orleans. It's just that, you know, of course, that we hear all the time in New Orleans music. And then, of course, uh, meeting Justin years later um, in a pub in Leyland. And just said, join the joy of band. <laughs> Were you singing your play at that time? I was, yeah, I was singing in quite a few other bands. Were you were singing in that pub that night? Um, not that night, but there was another night I was singing in a pub. Um, I don't know if I should tell you this. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and Justin was sat at the bar having a few, and he comes up to me and said, I think I've just fallen in love. Uh, and this was like way before we got together or anything. I was like, oh, right, who's this guy? You know? <laughs> and then like a couple of years later, he was talking about getting a band together. And I'd heard him play, funnily enough. Like I said, I worked in this pub and he was playing in the pub across the road on the piano. And I could hear this incredible boogie boogie piano. I was like, who is that? So I just left the bar, said to my friend, that just stay and watch the bar, go and listen to this, this piano. And obviously that was just him. Yeah. And then I was too shy to talk to him after that. <laughs> so, yeah, so then we got the band together. But the, t but the, the band that we got together was um, a band called Mamaroon. 
which is also a New Orleans song. Um, but it was, but it was more sort of uh, going out playing weddings and sort of that kind of that kind of stuff. So. And was your repertoire New Orleans? Not really. We did a we did a bit of boogie woogie and a bit of that kind of thing, but it wasn't. I wouldn't call it New Orleans. It's Tim Tebow's. It was more sort of funky, funky sort of solely, you know, modest sort of poppy stuff. Um, and that was all right, but I soon realised that we had this shared love of, of the blues. And, and I remember him playing in his album of Henry Butler, who, who was, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Henry Butler, piano player uh, from New Orleans. He died last year. Unbelievable piano player and singer, actually. And this album was called Orle New Orleans Inspiration. And then um, it had Tippy Tina on it, and, and this other composition called All Means Inspiration. It's just incredible. I, Justin might play a little bit of it tonight for you. I hope he does. And then um, I just fell in love with that album, really, and then sort of <coughs> got in, in love, fell in love with New Orleans music, and, and then sort of Irma Thomas and all those guys, all those people. So I, I suppose this um, come, goes back a long way, but really it comes together. So how did you move on from your social band yeah. to play New Orleans? Did you gradually go or suddenly went up one day and say, just send that woman New Orleans? Well, <clears throat> we, we had this Tippy Tina on the side as well, we were sort of doing the odd gig. Uh, we sent a, an album, a CD, a little track, some tracks to you, and you gave us some gigs in Birmingham. And it, just, we just found that we just enjoyed it so much more. We had lovely responses from audiences, you know, playing the music that we wanted to play, and that was it really. Just said, oh, let's just forget it and see what happens from there, you know. I'm sure we all know where Tipitina comes from. It's, well, it's a, tip, it's a song by Professor Longhair, who's again a, a New Orleans pianist. Um, <clears throat> also, the name of a venue in New Orleans, brilliant venue, big, massive, huge venue. Um, that obviously stages lots of different bands. Uh, we had the pleasure of going there in 2013. Uh, seeing Dr. John there, that was a big, mm. a big treat while we were there. It's fantastic. You created a bit of a splash in New Orleans as well. You <coughs> with a, news, a newspaper man who wrote for New Orleans Times Picayune. That's it? right, yeah. I can't remember his name. But Keith he, Spear. Yeah, so he, he fell in love with what they did and followed them around. To, to, well, you tell us. We were so lucky to meet Keith. He was incredible just just so warm to us so nice to us and uh, basically just took us around and showed us <clears throat> all the places to you know and met we got we got to meet Herman Thomas we got to meet a, a guy called Lionel Furbos I don't know if any of you have heard of him he was at the time he was 103 and um, he still played he played with his venue in New Orleans twice a week um, and uh, he was a trumpeter, fantastic trumpeter. Was he a preservation hall? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that's right. But we saw him We saw him at um, a guy called Irving May Mayfield, have you heard of him? Yeah. Another brilliant jazz trumpeter, obviously a young man in his 30s. And he's having this big, big do at his house. And if it wasn't for Keith, we wouldn't have got in there. It was only sort of, there's only a few of us there. And Lionel was yeah. the guest of honor at this event, you know, and played and he sang and it was, Oh, I was crying my eyes out. It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. The things that we saw and the and the places that we went, thanks to Keith and John Cleary, actually, which was lovely. Uh, Tell us about John Cleary. So John Cleary again. He's a, a piano player from the UK, from London. Uh, but he went over to New Orleans when he was about seventeen, I think, and worked in the Maple Leaf Bar. Um, and he was a he was doing de decorating, you know. Renovating the place and uh, got got to meet James Booker, who was a, another New Orleans pianist, legendary New Orleans type pianist, and then um, he ended up sort of work, doing a little bit of gigs there. And he's now really famous, he's Grammy winning, he's, he's huge in, in the states. And he comes over to England quite a lot as well. Um, but he was he was again very warm to us, looked after us, took us round. Um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip. We had the best trip ever, I think. It was. Uh, I mean, it's in touch with anyone, you know? Keith, I'm in touch with Keith quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Does he still work for the No, he doesn't. Well, what's happened is there's, there's, a, there's another um, newspaper called the New Orleans Advocate, and he left the PKO, there was things going on, he left them and then started working with this other one, and now they've joined forces. So, so yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, you mentioned James Butler. Do you remember how Jumps and Jungle described him? The uh, the best the best um, black gay junkie one-eyed piano play, piano player you'd ever know. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. We also met the person who made that film called. We did, Lily. Talk to you about that. So uh, a lady called Lily Caber, who's um, not she was she's not actually from New Orleans, but she she uh, she worked in the Maple Leaf Bar. This again, this famous bar. If you ever go to New Orleans, go to the Maple Leaf Bar. It's not right in the, it's not in the thing, but you have to get a taxi, go out of it. And it's a fantastic bar. Not unlike this, you know, very sort of, um, you know, great, not very big. And then, um, and James used to play there a lot. And um, she, 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 she made a film, but she got told all these stories about him. Um, and she ended up making a film about him because he was really underrated. I mean, he was an absolute genius. He should have been massively famous. He should have, I mean, he worked with Aretha. Uh, loads of loads of famous people. He did lots of playing on their albums, but never, unfortunately, never just tipped over himself and got to that. But he was, he had, he was a troubled man, but incredible. Genius, genius. Vocally as well. Vocally as well. I love his voice. But very difficult to work with. <laughs> yes, apparently. Apparently, yeah. Um, and record. <laughs> then, yes. we've, um, I wonder if some questions to answer, Tanya. I'm sure there are questions to come. So, can we make this part one of two? And next time yeah. we, we do part two, I'm very rushing it because it's, I'm loving it. Remember, Tanya? Oh, so, yeah, I'd love to. Really, that's when you need to talk to some new ideas because, I mean, in fact, you met Emma Thomas. Oh. Tell us about Emma Thomas. Well, um, Thomas, um, she was the just lovely. I felt like I'd known her all my life. I mean, she, she brought us into her home. She, I was out here, I was pregnant with Zach at the time, and uh, she predicted that I'd have a little boy, and she was, uh, we, were, we were a bit panicking because we had a, a gig at Ronnie Scott's about three weeks before I was due to have Zach. Like, we've been really low. She went, it's your stomach that's pregnant, not your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she was just wonderful, absolutely. She was just wonderful. And, uh, she, yeah, she predicted I'd have a little boy, and she gave me tips on vocal hygiene and vocal health. and She was just... Age at the time? Her age, mm -hmm. uh, mid seventies. Yeah. yeah, she's still going. She's still going. She's still gigging now, uh, but she's 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 one that she was like the Doctor John. You know, she's recorded with Doctor John. In fact, um, but she's at that age. You know, and she was she was affected by Katrina massively. She had a she used to have a bar uh, club in New Orleans that she used to get you know get lots of people coming and playing. And that just got completely wiped out after Katrina, so she lost that. <coughs> um, she had a lovely home. All the Grammys were there from the yeah, fabulous lady. Fabulous yeah, lady. Time she, she about Tremaine, which is, that's, oh yeah, that's very important. You will know Tremaine. Tell it gives a quick resume. What, of the actual program yeah. of it. Yeah. Okay, not so the, not the area. Probably. Right, so Treme is based. Um, it was a it was a um, series uh, based on. Uh, an area in New Orleans called the Treme, which is a quite a, a deprived area, really, and was the, the area that was hit most, <clears throat> that was most affected by Katrina and the storm. Um, and so it, it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I think there was about five series made of it. Um, I wish they'd make some more, actually, because a uh, brilliant, brilliant uh, show, an American thing. But we bought all the box sets before we went and watched them all, you know. So it'd be one of those you sat there at night. Oh, we've got time for another. We've got time. For <laughs> they had some great music on as well. You get all like Dr. John played on it, John Cleary, all, all the New Orleans greats, you know. We'll explore that more next time. Yeah. Question time, folks. <laughs> we have five minutes. It's not Treme. T R E M E. Treme. Oh, I remember it. Yeah, really. Treme. Yeah. Yes. Debbie, while, while you were in New Orleans, did you or Justin get a chance to play with anyone? And yes, did? we did. We did. Um, uh, Justin played um, with a, a drummer called Johnny Vidakovic. I don't know if you've heard of him. Very famous New Orleans drummer. 